Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as usual, we'll give it just about a minute to let everybody populate. Uh, thank you to everybody in the community for joining us today. Um, this is a uh, Department of Medicine sponsored uh, town hall focusing on modeling, uh, COVID-19 modeling. And I'm really uh, happy to have uh, a lot of our experts joining us today. Uh, Drs. Nigam Shah, Kevin Shulman, David Shankar, Kristen Stoudemire, Joshua Salman. We also have Dr. Nira Huja, who is my division chief and in charge of the medicine wards, who is going to be serving as our kind of end user, the person who's been really taking this information, the modeling information to apply it on the medicine wards. Um, uh, Dr. Harrington was going to join us today, but he got pulled into a chief's meeting, uh, a chair's meeting uh, just recently, so he won't be able to join us live. But again, thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, with that being said, I will turn it over to Dr. Shah to start uh, the beginning of the presentation. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Errol. And uh, I will go into slideshow mode. Okay. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a team effort across many colleagues, some of whom are on the panel here today with me. Uh, their names are the, the, towards the bottom of the slide, and uh, you'll, you'll get to see them in this sequence. So without further ado, let's just dive in. There's a lot of excitement about modeling, so let's see what we can uh, uh, share today. Okay, so I would imagine a lot of you, or perhaps even most of you, have seen this uh, or some version of this picture from the uh, model built by IHME in Seattle, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And what I'm showing you is a screenshot from, uh, for California uh, for April 5th, at which point our predicted peak was on the 26th uh, and anticipating that we would need 1,500 to about 27,400 beds. And then April 6th, when new data became available in the form of the uh, assumptions around social distancing, which were then factored into the projections, the estimate changed from uh, the peak uh, to be at April 14th uh, and then the expected bed demand changing from uh, uh, what was before to about 2,400 to 10,500 beds. Now, the point of showing you this is to not say anything bad about the model. The IHME model is in fact quite good, but a good model needs accurate inputs. And the point that I'm gonna try to make is that without accurate inputs, we can't make use of what those models have to offer to us. And so I, I view this in four work areas that how can we have better inputs that help us make most sense of, uh, of the modeling. Uh, we can focus on purely the inputs and you know, these are three confirmed cases, hospitalizations and deaths that are most commonly used. Um, we can collect new data to reduce the assumptions or computations that are from those inputs that we're doing around transmission rates and growth rates and the fraction of asymptomatic carriers and yada, yada, yada. I mean, there's like 15 different things you would have to calculate in order to correctly populate a model. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Solomon will uh, give us a flavor for that today. Then there's the underlying mechanics of the model. And again, there's many varieties of these. Uh, you could have simple trends. You could have statistical projections. You could have what's called compartmental models or SEIR models. And then finally, depending on the output and the uncertainty in it, the range of the point estimate, the uncertainty in the time to peak and the amount of lead time offered, you would do different things with it. And uh, we'll also discuss how we can reduce that uncertainty and what are the kinds of uncertainty that are more important to reduce if you want to make better sense of these models. And then all of these things have to be done at varying levels of geographic resolution, ranging from the institution to a city, to a county, to a state. Uh, as uh, you know, on the previous slide, for example, if we had a state level uh, projection saying we need between 1,500 to 27,000 beds, I mean, that's, that's a, good, a good projection to have, but where do you put them uh, without knowing uh, any geographic details? If the beds are needed in Los Angeles and you have them in San Mateo, that's not very helpful. So there's a broad range of efforts on our campus in all of these areas. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is just taking the or orange box around the model, turning that into three columns, and then adding some geographic resolution of institution, county, and state level. The check marks are the kinds of things you'll get to see today. I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, trends that we had spotted early on. 
and then David Schenker will lead you through some hospital and county level projections, uh, then moving on to uh, SEIR models. And below are all of the different departments from which the different faculty have built models. Uh, we don't have uh, people from biology and mechanical engineering. They've also done SEIR models, some of which are already published. It's a bro broad variety of efforts on our campus. So I'm focusing on trends. I'm going to show you two examples. The first one is uh, around symptom trends and the implications of that for symptom checkers. So on the left is a medium post about profiling presenting symptoms of patients screened at, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, at our institution. Uh, what I'm going to show you is based on about 900 patients, uh, based on text processing system to identify what the care provider records when they're screening a patient, either in the outpatient setting or the ED. And then we make calculations like these. Uh, you don't need to pay too much attention to the numbers. The point here is that given an observation like cough, we want to be able to output a probability that what is the chance that you're a positive case, which is the second last column here, given you have that observation. And so that is about 8%. And you know, correspondingly, that much probably that you're not uh, positive. So the takeaway from such trends is that we'd need about 20 symptoms to get the probability of being positive given certain symptoms above 80%, as in to get a good, reliable classification. And most records have about eight symptoms. So that puts you in about 60% uh, range of uh, positive predictive value should you try to do purely symptom-based uh, classification uh, of, uh, of a COVID positive patient. So just something to think about as a lot of people are talking about symptom checkers, so this is something to pay attention to that uh, you know, some basic math tells us that there's a ceiling on how good you can get. Another trend is we, what we jokingly started calling the missing hospitalizations. So on the left is uh, case rates shown in a gray line over time and hospitalizations uh, shown in the orange and then the ICU portion uh, subset it in, in blue. The first dashed line, which is where this red arrow just came up, is March 16 when we put in the shelter in place. About March 28, is when the modeling group that's on the call here today, we started chatting about this divergence between the rate at which cases were rising and the rate at which the hospitalizations were rising. And you, know, you don't need to do too much calculation to see that there's a big divergence. Hospitalizations were not rising, but cases were. So that's why this uh, catchphrase of missing hospitalizations. And then if you dig deeper into such trends, we see that the age distribution of patients who are coming out positive has shifted. So the top panel in this right-hand side, you see uh, the people we're testing that are in gray, and then those that come out positive in, in uh, this dark orange. And as you can see, as time goes on from week 11 to 15, the orange distribution is shifting to the left. So younger people are coming out positive and they presumably are, are healthier enough, they do not need a hospital bed. So these are the kinds of things that just monitoring trends at institution level can help uh, uh, inform nuances around modeling. And then this flattening that we saw in the hospitalization, turns out that that was the same trend that other hospitals in our county were seeing. And this is data that uh, Joshua Solomon and, uh, and us, we got from our county, and then I, I just plotted it nicely here. And this URL above, you can go and see other trends that we're plotting and keeping track of. And I'm not gonna to dwell too much onto it. Uh, these are the kinds of plots that you can see um, uh, at that particular URL. So with that, I will hand off to uh, my colleague, David. And I need to Thank stop you. sharing for this door, right? There we go. Thank you. And so I'm... Um... David Schenker, I have appointments at the Children's Hospital, at the School of Medicine and Pediatrics, and also at the School of Engineering. And my group works specifically around hospital decision making. And we were first approached by Kevin Schulman and Kristen Stadmeyer, from whom you'll hear a little bit later, and looped into these projects that Negum is helping to coordinate and organize and lead some of, where we 
wanted to build a model to help forecast when the capacity of SHCs, ICU beds, ventilators, and acute care beds would be reached with the incoming COVID patients, as well as the patients who are already there. Now, what we initially thought was a much scarier scenario than fortunately what happened. So not knowing that at the time, we built a model that used the current number of COVID admissions, as well as estimates of the doubling time for admissions. To Nigam's point about how difficult it is to model something like this where there are so many unknowns, we wanted to create a parsimonious model with totally transparent inputs and relying only on data that we thought we had the best chance of estimating correctly, which early on in the growth of an epidemic, we chose to use doubling time. So what this model does is using actual Stanford census data as an input, all of the patients who are there for non-COVID and ICUs and acute care, as well as the doubling time for the new COVID admits and the number of days to predict, as well as the capacities of the ICU and the general medicine team on the unit, generates the forecasts for the ICU COVID census, the ventilator demand associated with everyone in the ICU, assuming half the people who, have co uh, who don't have COVID need ventilators and everyone who has COVID needs ventilators, as well as the ICU non-COVID census, which we saw decreasing due to the cancellation of elective surgeries and those beds being decanted. And similarly, projections for the inpatient floor census. The motivation here was to provide a plan to look ahead that Kristen and the surge team and others could use to mock up a variety of scenarios. And uh, she'll talk a little more about how this was used. In parallel with this, we also deployed this online so that any hospital that doesn't have their own analytics capabilities could use this model, input their own data and get their own estimates on when the demand is going to hit their capacity. In parallel with developing this hospital model, we also developed a regional model where for any state, the population is going to differ and the fraction of the population that's older is going to result in a higher expected rate of hospitalizations per number of people that get COVID. So then at the county level, this model allows us to translate the vulnerability of the population, as well as similar assumptions about the cumulative number of hospitalizations and the doubling time for the increase in the number of hospitalizations, which fortunately has gotten longer. And what this does is compare to the number of ICU and acute care beds in that county, or if several counties close together are added, then the numbers of beds across counties are combined. And these projections can be used for a region. Again, fortunately, the doubling times of the, in the area slowed significantly from what they were when we started the modeling. And the worst case scenarios of ICU demand exceeding available ICU beds has not materialized. And again, this model is available to every county in the country using data from the American Hospital Association and the US Census to figure out how vulnerable is that county's population and how many beds do they have so that others could make these types of estimates. There's potential subsequent use cases for these types of regional models as we learn more about the epidemic and have to make further decisions beyond hospital capacity. And others are going to talk about that better than I can. So thank you and I'm gonna pass it along to the next presenter. Great, thank you, David. I wanted to make a few comments uh, from Nigam and David's presentation from the end user perspective before turning it over to Joshua. 
So the symptom checker aspect is actually quite keen because it, on the one hand, you think, could it be used as a predictive model in the outpatient setting to trigger that, hey, this patient should be getting testing or they're getting potentially clinically worse and may need to see a higher level of care. The one symptom that was not on that symptom checker that we have seen in most, uh, probably about 50% of our inpatients is GI symptoms. So nausea has been quite prominent in about 50% of the patients that were admitted, and then uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, et cetera. And in fact, we've had some patients who were COVID positive that were only admitted, admitted for IV fluids um, from the dehydration from the gastrointestinal symptoms, so not because of the respiratory uh, issues. So although we think of this as a you know, pulmonary and upper respiratory tract infection, there, we know that there is a lower respiratory tract component to this as well as a gastrointestinal. Um, a few patients did have a bump in their creatinine and that was most likely AKI from the dehydration. Another comment that I wanted to make was regarding the missing hospitalizations. So the delta between the cases uh, that were detected and the hospitalizations. Granted, that's because of lower acuity. Uh, those patients that contribute to that delta did not meet criteria to be admitted. But what we did find is for the patients, many of the patients that were admitted had been tested positive anywhere from seven to 10 days prior. And although it, you know, more time and data needs to be assessed before we can make any definitive conclusions, it does seem that um, you know, after a week of progressive symptoms was a tipping point for a, a good number of patients to be admitted. And uh, that could vary from the pulmonary or GI uh, symptom, um, symptomatology. And then finally, the length of stay is an interesting one because in general, the average length of stay hovered around three to 3.5 days for most of these patients. And that also um, took into account that some patients were ready to be discharged but needed to go to a skilled nursing facility. As you know, there has not been a dedicated uh, COVID skilled nursing facility identified that would take all COVID patients in the area, although there is work around this. And Karen Nelson and Marina Martin have been uh, fantastically instrumental in investigating these opportunities. But that meant that some of the patients would hang around in the hospital a day or two, a little bit longer, until they were cleared for discharge to some place that would accept them. All right, I'm going to turn it now over to Joshua, who will uh, share the next part of our presentation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Josh Solomon, and I'm in the Center for Health Policy and Center for Primary Care and Outcomes Research. Now, uh, Nigam had asked me to, to start with just a little bit of information on some of the broader COVID-related work in my division, so I'll do that rather quickly. Work in PCOR around COVID has to do with three broad streams. The first is to use epidemiologic data and mathematical modeling to measure and forecast disease risk. The second to evaluate outcomes of disease control priorities. And the third is to tie these two streams together to give decision makers evidence-based options for tackling COVID-19. There are many projects underway, but I thought I would just mention a couple examples. Maria Polyakova and others have been examining the evidence on protective benefits of masks, Michelle Mello with colleagues has written a paper in New England Journal on failures of the federal response to COVID and how we might move past those. Jason Wang has described the response in Taiwan, which I think provides both a contrast to the US response as well as a uh, lesson perhaps for the, for the next phase. And there are many more projects by, by our PCOR researchers uh, and I encourage you all to check them out on the webpage, but let me turn now to the topic of policy modeling in particular. So one of the many remarkable things about this pandemic is the extent to which models have been quite central to policy discussions at the highest level. Models have been really important in decision-making. They've also, as Nigam hinted at, been important targets of criticism. And these three recent stories highlight those. Much of this I would say is valid criticism. Some of it, I would say, is based on misinterpretation and on unrealistic expectations, but it certainly emphasizes the need to be clear about aims, methods, uncertainties, interpretation, and use of models. Now, PCOR researchers, including myself, Jeremy Goldhaber Fiebert, and many others, have been working with decision makers at various levels to try to do modeling that can help inform their choices and policies 
And these levels span right here within Stanford Healthcare, as you've heard, a lot of work with Santa Clara County and the state of California, as well as research that is relevant to US national policy and to policy in several other countries, including Mexico, Brazil, and India. For all of the decision makers that we've been talking with, there are major questions that continue to evolve. And these include both analytic and descriptive questions, as well as policy questions that attach closely to each of those. Questions around what course the epidemic could take if left unchecked, linked to policy questions about what we could do to prevent that. And those have been, as you've all seen, quite influential over decisions to implement strong public health measures and other non-pharmaceutical interventions. Questions about the likelihood that surging cases could overwhelm hospital capacity has, uh, as you all know, been quite central to surge planning efforts. And we'll hear a bit more about that. Uh, we're now in a phase in which two other types of questions have largely taken over the discussions. How do we know what impact current measures are having and under what conditions can we start to think about relaxing or replacing these? And I know that Kevin is going to explore the, those questions in a little more detail. Decision makers everywhere need to answer these questions with a combination of three different things. One is data from existing information systems. Two is models as tools for synthesizing those data, and especially for forecasts and scenario analyses. And three is potential new sources of information that could be most valuable to improve decisions. So I want to spin through each of these quickly using the example of modeling that we've been doing closely with the Santa Clara County Health Department. So two dashboards that you all have probably seen that Santa Clara County uh, now publishes and updates regularly illustrate some of the existing data sources. The first is shown here, which is basic surveillance information, including confirmed cases and deaths. The second shows administrative data from facilities, including how many people are hospitalized, how many are in the ICU, how many need and are using vents, and uh, you've seen and will see these from our own healthcare system as well. And modeling comes in as a tool to try to bring these information sources together. So just to try to describe the current situation, to try to project that forward, and to think about what might happen under different scenarios. So let me walk uh, through an example from the Santa Clara County model. If we start here with confirmed cases, we know that these represent some fraction of all the cases but we don't know exactly what fraction. Uh, and you'll have seen several studies by Stanford colleagues, uh, including one released today, to try to measure this at population level. With a simple epidemiologic model, we can try to reconstruct that case count using parameters that reflect what we currently know about transmission dynamics and natural history of infection, and what we can estimate with uncertainty about how many cases are not detected. So with models like this, we can project outcomes forward and we can reevaluate the model as new data emerge. So here I'm just showing you how a model can be fit first through uh, data that goes through March 16th in our county, and then tracing out two possible trajectories from there. The counterfactual, which would show ongoing spread in the absence of social distancing measures, and an alternative in the blue that traces how interventions that have been put into place might change that curve. And over time, we can compare these projections to data as they continue to flow in and recalibrate the model along the way. And I think probably the most important thing to emphasize in this sort of model is that there are major uncertainties about a lot of different aspects. The models can help to reveal those uncertainties, but the models themselves can't resolve them. What models can do is let us trace out the implications of those uncertainties on outcomes that we care about, and this is what I call uh, the use of models as what-if machines. So as an example, these are three projections uh, through the end of this month, looking at how case trends may play out, depending on how well we as a community adhere to the social distancing measures in place. And Santa Clara County is using scenarios like these as they continue to plan, but also for their public communications on the importance of maintaining the public health orders, and on um, complying with the physical distancing requirements, as you can see here on the website. Uh, we've also created an interactive tool for health officers in the county to use to explore uncertainties. Uh, just showing you a couple screenshots from that, you can see here that it's possible to change parameter values to calibrate the model under different assumptions, but also to play scenarios forward and see how longer term trends may unfold. 
Uh, so I want to end with uh, some brief thoughts on what I described as the third leg of the data and modeling connection, and that is to explore where new information might be the most valuable. And models, I think, are very good at shining a light on these sorts of questions. So in addition to their utility as what-if calculators for policymakers, models also allow us to be systematic and explicit about both the knowledge and the uncertainty that derives from available data. So one way that models can do this is by serving as engines for evidence synthesis. We start with a model of the epidemiologic characteristics of the disease, like the ones I've been describing. Uh, these models tell us about transmission dynamics, about progression of disease. We can combine that epidemiologic model with a measurement model that describes the data generation processes behind the different outcomes that we observe. So we've talked about cases and hospitalizations and deaths, and we've talked about the challenges in interpreting those. But we can also gain power, as you heard from Ningham, uh, for inference about uh, what's going on in the population if we can add additional observations. Uh, especially if we can uh, observe things that are at early parts of the process. So for example, uh, if we know about how many people are testing, if we know about uh, symptoms as measured in symptom surveys uh, and through other routes, if we can learn about uh, the prevalence of antibodies or the prevalence of disease in broader community surveys, uh, as Julie Parsonet and Bonnie Maldonado and others are working on, uh, and also if we can find ways to measure the behavioral response to policies, as in the many tech-based mobility estimates that I'm sure you've all seen, as well as lower tech alternatives from surveys. So models can give us the formal logic framework and the estimation environment to synthesize these different sources, for example, using standard approaches from Bayesian statistics. The second way that models can be useful in this light as, as tools for quantifying the relative importance of particular uncertainties for decision making, uh, and especially where it can be most useful to try to reduce these uncertainties to improve decision making. And this is just an example, I won't go through the details here, but uh, show this just as an example of such an analysis. Uh, this particular example comes from some work that I've been doing with a collective of students, fellows, and faculty spanning Stanford, Harvard, and Yale, and a few other institutions. Uh, and in this example, we were looking at the potential decision value of new information on two different important factors. One of those, the intervention effects from the non-pharmaceutical interventions in place, the other new information on seroprevalence. Uh, so I'd like to end uh, by quoting what I think is quite a nice summary of both the pitfalls as well as the promise of modeling. This comes from a recent uh, piece in The Atlantic by Zeynep Tefeki, who writes, if models don't give us certainty and asking them to do so would be a big mistake, what good are they? And the answer he gives, models, gives us, models give us something more important, agency to identify and calibrate our actions with the goal of shaping our future. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And let me pass over to, I believe, Kevin. And, and Kevin, as, uh, as you're setting up the slides, I just wanted to invite people to uh, feel free to answer, put questions in the question and answer function. I'm sure you guys all know where to find that by now. And uh, we'll certainly get to them once we're done with all the presentations. Actually, Kristen's next up. Great, Kristen. Yep, I'll tee up. Okay, well, Josh, thank you for that great setup. Um, as you were speaking, I actually deleted a couple of my slides that were uh, intending to uh, frame what models are and what they can do. And um, so I think that that was, that was really a nice tee up to what we've been doing here um, at Stanford with, with the models. And I have to say too, we're very lucky to be here at Stanford where we have so many uh, smart people working on this, but it, it really did help our hospital efforts significantly. So um, first off, how how can we take all of the all these models, all these data, and then projections, and and put them to good use? Um, 
And there, there are more than this to be sure, but uh, I just pulled out these points um, because I think that they, these were what we discovered to be really important. And I think one is when you start to present graphics about what's happening or what could happen, um, it really helps get everybody on the same page and to be able to have the same discussion. And this is particularly important for pandemics where there are a lot of questions about what is happening. Um, timing is another important thing that can help with this. So as we were marching along day to day and doing projections, we were scrambling as, you know, as, as everybody was to make sure that we had what we needed in the case of the surge. And so the timing piece is very important and I'll touch on that again later uh, in this talk. Um, key to um, what you heard David speak about was that we, we really need to use the projections to be able to match our resources and to acquire the resources that we need. Um, and then in, a, in addition to all these things that already discussed by Josh is that we, um, you know, regional coordination is an important piece of this as well. And so having, having the model tied to um, organizations beyond the four walls of our hospital is important. And then finally, as Kevin will be talking about, um, how do we begin to roll back um, some, of our, some of these interventions and what's the impact on the hospital? So this has already uh, been touched on by some of the other speakers, but there are, the way to look at this is that there are, there are you know, maybe two big buckets of models and there are many more than this, but for the most part, you have the epidemiological mo models, which, um, uh, which you've seen some, some of these presented already. And then David presented the hospital admission model, um, which is one that we use and I'll show in a moment. And the nice thing about the hospital admission model is that it's, a, it's um, more of a lightweight model that's easy to deploy and was easy for us to use to, to do with our within hospital planning. Now, now what do we do with these, with these models? Well, in any situation of mass casualty or a pandemic or any surge at all, there are three large categories of resources that you need to be planning for. And these all work together. They are not separate categories. They all depend on one another. So physical space, obviously the beds in the hospital, um, and people being an important one. And you have to think of categories of people who you wouldn't otherwise consider. For example, housekeeping in the case of pandemic is very important. And then also um, ventilators and um, we realize renal replacement therapy and pharmaceuticals as well. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot that, uh, that goes into this. So pulling up a model like David had showed earlier, and, and, and maybe I'll just walk through it uh, quickly to show people um, how we used it. But in, if you look at the two horizontal lines across the top, the ventilator capacity and the ICU capacity, these were the two that we were tracking the most closely. We also were using this to, to match our um, surge teams that we would need to build and estimate how many surge teams we might need at various points in time. But by plotting this, we were able to get some general idea of how we'd have to expand our ventilator capacity. And this led to um, efforts to purchase more ventilators and also to identify ventilators that we had available in the hospital already. Now we also discovered as we were looking at the countywide data, that there was a lot that was changing. We didn't uh, talk a lot earlier about the concept of doubling time, but doubling times basically are the doubling times in this case of hospital admissions. And we began to note that as time went on, the Stanford doubling times, which are in green, began to lengthen. So while at first we were doubling our admissions at a pretty quick rate, over time these began to really slow down. And when we were tracking these and feeding these back into our model, and what we did notice was that that was not the case in Santa Clara, and then doubling times were in fact uh, becoming shorter over time. And as it turns out, this, uh, this reflected an imbalance through the county in terms of the hospitals that were receiving COVID patients. So we discovered that um, some of the hospitals were feeling very overloaded while others like ours were feeling like we had much excess capacity. So this speaks to the importance of, of taking these models, linking and communicating outside the walls of our hospital um, in case there's a need to do balance loading across a county or a region. And this is balance loading, not just for the acute phase, but also how do you balance load on the discharge end when you have people who are in need of um, uh, prolonged care, but who, who no longer need the acute, who no longer meet the requirements for acute care hospitals. So now just for a quick moment, and this is gonna, Kevin will be talking about this in more detail, 
Um, but what I did want to point out is that models have another benefit in helping us think about other ways, and that's particularly relevant for COVID. We've just been through the, the first surge, which gratefully for us was not um, was not uh, as challenging. But that's not to say we're not going to have um, other ways of admission. And so, if you if you plot out the hospitalizations that we experienced, which are here in black, and, and you fit a model as Josh was describing, showing predicted hospitalizations and and, and uh, infected people in the population. You can see that there's a there's about a 10 to 14 day uh, delay in the peaks for those two numbers. So if you know that that's happening and you say, well, we're going to try to estimate what's going to happen in two weeks, the hospital has to be able to prepare, and we ha might have a walking back of social distancing, then we can say, all right, we'll make an assumption around that, and we can model, and, and these are where the models that Josh and, and others are, are building that could be helpful. We'll say these. This would be the impact, and this is how many more infections we might get. But importantly, for the, from the perspective of the hospital, is we might see a rise in hospitalizations 10 to 14 days after this, and and the degree of this would depend on specific policies and our assumptions around the impact on that. And then, if we were to take that back now to our hospital. And we look at a model where we say, how would these projections impact what's happening? We have to integrate that with our own hospital operations. So in, in this graphic, which is, is not a natural prediction, it's just here for um, demonstration purposes. If you look at the black line, that's our surge ICU bed capacity. And the light gray line is our regularly staffed ICU beds. The, the blue line, as you can see, it's, it's gone down over time, as was shown earlier, because of the cancellation of elective cases. But if we start to step up elective cases in the beginning of May, which begin to fill our ICUs, and then sometime after that, have the NPI reduction efforts result in some increase in hospitalizations, we might find we're having to dip into our surge beds. And so this is, this is how the modeling that everyone here is doing can then be uh, brought back and used within our hospital in order to do appropriate planning. And this also, as, as David was pointing out, he's built these tools for other hospitals, so other hospitals in our region and around the country can also um, begin to take advantage of some of these benefits. So our, our next steps with modeling to see, um, to see how our hospital need to respond is what happens when we start walking back our social distancing efforts. And how do we coordinate that with our normal operations, such as uh, such as um, uh, elective cases? And another another um, wild card to in this is that if schools return um, or seasonality affects um, our our rates, this could also have a big impact on what's happening at uh, at at our hospital and what sort of uh, resources we need to mobilize. So thank you, and uh, I will now hand off to Kevin. There you go. Excellent, thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks for those of you who are putting questions up, and as you guys are already doing, please do vote up questions you find um, you'd like to be answered first. Well, thanks. Um, you know, this has really been an incredibly uh, rewarding and collaborative effort. The um, you know, these models, you know, what they really do is drive questions. It drives questions about data or data, it drives questions about planning. Um, and uh, where we've gotten to now as a country is we, the country has actually given the healthcare system time uh, to build capacity uh, to take care of the virus. So, you know, our estimates are very small proportion of the population is infected. The rest of us are still at risk. Um, there's obviously enormous economic consequences to this idea that we were not uh, being very surgical in terms of how we reduce viral spread in which populations we address. Uh, and so there's a tremendous need now to begin to walk, understand how to walk this back. Um, and, and so that uh, we've now actually broadened the team uh, even further than uh, all the different uh, people that uh, have worked so far in the modeling uh, to bring in the business school and economists over there. Um, one of the observations that uh, I heard loud and clear from them is, you know, some of the ideas that we're putting around from the epidemiologic perspective uh, are not feasible. So employers are not going to hire uh, and go back to work when we say, well, if in two weeks we were wrong, 
uh, we're going to have to shut you back down again. We're going to have to lay people off. And so how do we begin to think about the relationship between the policy choices uh, that we're making, the impact on the virus or the epidemiology, uh, as Josh kind of talked about, how do we knock that down in terms of spread? How do we understand the, the economics impact? Uh, because obviously if we win the game and, and keep the virus from spreading, but a significant proportion of our population is starving, that's not a, a great trade-off and great balance. So how do we resolve those two at the same time? And then how do we understand the impact of the healthcare system? The healthcare system here in this case is not actually, is here to support uh, the care of patients who uh, have the most severe form of this illness. Um, are there ways we can think about, you know, expanding, Nigam talks about, you know, how do we have surge capacity? If we come up with a modeling effort that says, you know what, we could reduce spread by 50% if we do X and we're wrong, well, that means that the hospital is going to end up uh, having uh, an influx of, of patients and we better be prepared for that. Um, and so this idea about now, how do we move from here to whatever comes next, really how, is bringing together all the different work that's been done so far uh, and integrating that into uh, what we hope will be advice for policymakers. Um, that will include specific ideas about how we can reduce and slow the spread of the virus. That would be tied to economic policies or ways to support uh, people. Maybe we need to have alternative work week programs. The governor uh, uh, issued a program where we're going to pay people uh, for staying home if they're sick for two weeks. Well, what happens if we do screening uh, or if we do contract tracing and say you've been exposed, you got to quarantine for two weeks, you come back to work and then all of a sudden you've been exposed again. Are we going to pay for people for four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks and how are employers going to deal with that? Um, and then finally, how do we keep track of this in real time? Nigam uh, has uh, been doing some really interesting work with uh, one of his students at Berkeley uh, that asks the question like, how are we gonna build surveillance systems? So testing, uh, Bob Kaplan, who also might be uh, uh, on the call, testing is not necessarily a panacea, it's a systematic way to reduce some of the uncertainty in these models. Um, and so how do we understand the baseline incidence and prevalence of the disease? How do we understand where it's spreading, obviously, to give us enough time, as, as Chris Dunn talked about, the two weeks uh, before the healthcare system is going to see something and so we're prepared and can react. Uh, so this is bringing together all of the modeling effort we've done so far and then looking forward to hopefully in a really short term uh, building a framework and getting some recommendations out. Um, all of this, uh, as you can hear, really started with the date uh, not, uh, it was probably about 30 days ago, uh, started with daily phone calls from uh, some or all of the people on the team uh, to build all this stuff in re real time. Uh, all these multidisciplinary teams came together. And the exciting thing at Stanford is not only interest at the medical school, but the interest across campus in trying to figure out ways that people's insights can come together to, to try and help us with these problems. So uh, Errol, let me uh, stop there and, uh, and turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. And thanks to all of you guys uh, for your great presentations. Um, if that, with that being said, I'm going to move into some of the questions now, uh, Nigam, unless there's any of the other comments you guys have before we transition over. And just so you guys know, this is being recorded. We will post this uh, on our Department of Medicine YouTube channel so you can take a look again or, or share it with whomever wasn't able to watch live. Um, also, uh, as Kevin just finished, uh, Kevin will be leading uh, the main the, our feature present, presenter at Grand Rounds uh, this Wednesday as well, talking more, expanding more on the economics of this uh, pandemic. So we'll move into the first question. Uh, the first one comes from Yuri Ladebaum. Yuri asked, uh, uh, the much publicized IHME model now predicts uh, 69,000 total deaths in the US. The projection assumes social distancing, distancing at, that, that results in no further cases in the US after early June. Uh, does that have face validity and by comparison the curve uh, the actual curve cumulative deaths in Europe is 90 plus thousand, uh, and the U.S. seems to be matching that curve with a lag. Do we really think the U.S. will flatten out dramatically compared to Europe? That one there. Nigam, any thoughts on that? Uh, I haven't I haven't kept track of the IHME models, uh, European or uh, U.S. predictions. I'm more focused on the 
the the surrounding hundred square hundred mile radius, so to speak. Yeah, so it's I'll take a, exactly. yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll take a quick crack at that. Um, if you can hear me, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of scrutiny and criticism of the IHME model, in part because it's had a lot of prominence, including in the White House estimates and forecasts. Um, I think one of the major criticisms of the model uh, derives from the way that it's estimated. So unlike a lot of the models uh, that you see out there, there's no mechanisms of transmission and spread and interventions uh, that are embedded in the IHME model. It's a, it's a statistical curve fitting model. Uh, and, and what a lot of people have observed is that that may then uh, not do a very good job at describing uh, how cases and deaths might start to decline after they, they peak. Uh, and I think it also doesn't have very explicit links between interventions and how those may play out in, in population level health outcomes. And I think both of those are reasons why we should think about the projections, projections especially on the way down from a peak uh, with some amount of caution and scrutiny. Uh, I think the IHME model in the way that it's set up isn't necessarily ideally suited to answer questions like that. And, and I think the, the other part of the question about uh, what's likely to happen after June uh, is another weak point of that model. I think absent mechanisms, it's really not able to describe the likely resurgence that would happen uh, if we get too relaxed about the current measures in place. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh and, and Nigam. Moving on to the next question, uh, Mark asks, the key question is how to balance the benefits of reducing infections by a population intervention with unintended cons consequences like losing jobs, especially those who are the most vulnerable, reduce access to healthcare for other conditions like cancer, heart disease. Shouldn't we be predicting those adverse effects as well, of the, of the unintended consequences? Um, on the viral transmission. So should we be balancing the bad things, the things, the patients that aren't getting to the hospital right now? Are we doing anything along those lines? Can that be done? Yeah, I don't know. Um, go, go ahead, Kevin. You answer the e economic side uh, and then I'll take on the other medical conditions. Sure. Um, on the, I, I think this is absolutely correct. I think we've, we've had, like the, obviously no one, <laughs> Nobody planned uh, uh, for this epidemic, and, and we are finding ourselves in a position where we don't have enough kind of pre-built models, uh, and especially policy models. So uh, this is, none of us have had uh, an experience with this before. So uh, now we're really trying to figure out how do we balance. Um, and, you know, it also could be across populations. What we're seeing a lot uh, yeah, is that this is a disease of aging populations, and this is a disease uh, of people with comorbidities, and maybe we need different policies for, for different groups of people. I, I'm hoping over in the next very short period of time, we'll get to begin to answer some of those questions. Yeah, and, and the second part of the question, which was uh, the reduction in access to care for other conditions, and what are the impacts of that? Um, there's a couple of groups that I know of that have started to take this on. The, the most uh, sort of visible one is uh, the Odyssey community where people have started putting in place uh, sort of historical trend counters, so to speak, so that as new data flows in, we can keep tracking to what extent our routine colonoscopy is going down, to what extent, uh, you know, preventive annual visits have gone down. And from that, we could extrapolate what would be the effect on uh, on the, this lost care or effect of this lost care. And you're absolutely correct that this is something that does need to be factored in um, and it's not being done as good, well as it should have been. Actually, I'd like to add something and that engineers actually have built models explicitly for this scenario. There's a wonderful paper from 2010 called the optimal control of non-pharmaceutical interventions where if you assume you have some way to compare the cost of the lives lost to the cost of the economic damage, and you assume you understand how NPIs reduce disease spread, then you can design policies that are optimal in the sense they minimize these costs. However, with all of the points that Josh and others have brought up, the inputs to those models are notoriously difficult to understand. And the, my group is working on how to 
adjust those models to the kind of specific things that Kevin mentioned, like differences across populations and vulnerability. But again, the economic and medical inputs and epidemiology inputs to that are probably significantly harder than the actual engineering to solve the problem once you know those inputs. Great, thank you guys. Uh, moving on to the next question, it's a little more simpler, uh, straightforward at least. Uh, where does the R0 of 0.8 with shelter in place come from? Right there. Uh, I, it's on my slide, so it's, uh, it, it's somewhat made up, but I think I copied it from Nigam. Uh, it looks yeah. like <laughs> looks like yeah you know, an estimate of where we're about now, um, yeah. you know, with the shelter in place in place. So uh, I, I mean it's a range, right? You can't give an exact number. So I'm happy to share the uh, work you alluded to, Kevin, the f work with the faculty at Berkeley and a couple of folks at MIT. I mean we're looking at you know the, the New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and under certain assumptions it appears that our, the, uh, uh, the transmission rate has, is between 0.6 to 0.8 right? we, in the presence of NTIs. Um, it's an estimate with all of those uh, caveats that go with it that we're assuming that uh, the reduction in mobility that is seen in these uh, uh, cell phone movements is interpretable in a certain manner and so on. So, but the analysis is now published, it's online, well, it's not peer reviewed, but it is put out there for anybody to critique. And I'm sure the group would be very grateful for people if they shared their insights on how to do that better. So just to make this town hall more fun, I'm gonna respectfully disagree a little bit uh, with that estimate uh, and, the, and make the following observation. That strikes me as likely to be lower than what we're seeing in the county now. And this has to do with a, a question that Daniel Fischel, Fisher asks coming up, which is why are we still seeing roughly 50 or 60 cases per day? Uh, and you know, the math of, of R says that if it's below one, we should start to see the number of cases drop um, at, at a, with, with perhaps a certain lag since there's a lag to diagnosis. Um, so I, I would love if it were the case that, that R were as low as 0.6, but I'm still waiting to sort of see the evidence uh, that would make me confident in, in a value that's low. What I'm seeing is a, is a flat number of cases that's a little bit mysterious, but certainly tell, tells me that it's too early uh, to feel a lot of reassurance that, that we've really dropped current transmission um, substantially. So I, so I think we have a ways to go. Uh, I'm joking when I say that I, I disagree because I don't know R any better than, than Nigam or any. any yeah, it, it's, I, it's the point I think which is coming out here is that most people trying to derive this number from existing inputs is to make a bunch of assumptions and we don't know what the right assumptions are. And that I agree with. <laughs> Excellent. But, um, I think, yeah, Errol, this comes back to um, one of the things actually Nigam's brought up. If, if we make these policy recommendations, we're going to make them based on our best estimate, uh, whether that's pooled estimates of experts across the country, whether it's whatever scientific input we have. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to be facing pretty significant uncertainty. And so the question is, how do we protect ourselves? You know, if, if in fact an idea, you know, if everyone wore a mask, uh, but went back to work or we opened up to schools, and in fact, it turns out the masks don't do anything, how would we get information really quickly that we've made a mistake in terms of some of our assumptions? So uh, the assumptions here are not meant to be uh, truth. These assumptions are uh, hypotheses that need to be tested uh, rigorously, and I think that's another big piece of of all of this is as we make changes to policy, um, we need to know where to look to see if we've made an error. Thanks so much, Kevin. I'm going to keep going with that same theme since uh, you mentioned Daniel's question. Uh, I'll probably jump to it, especially since there's a few questions in here. I want to make sure I understand it. Uh, he's asking, what is known or inferable from the current roughly constant number of daily new cases in the Bay Area? What are the contributions of the long tail of the distribution of time from exposure to being tested with exposures occurring before March 17th? There's a little more to it, but I don't wanna bring it too much. You guys um, understand that question? 
a little bit convoluted to me. I was wondering if maybe you guys understand. Well, Josh is nodding yes. <laughs> yeah, Josh, uh, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief because I don't want to monopolize this, but uh, I, I think this does get back to, to what's a little bit mysterious that I was mentioning earlier, which is, you know, the shelter in place and other NPIs have now been in effect going on a month. And so even with the long tail of, uh, of the disease sort of taking its course, we, we really would expect that those should be driving new cases down. Of course, the confirmed cases for lots of reasons that we've described today are not necessarily a good signal of what's happening in terms of onward transmission. Um, but, I, but I think it is something that we're really trying to understand. I, I think one of the things that we haven't mentioned so far is that there's a great deal of heterogeneity even within our county in terms of the burden and the intensity of transmission across different areas. And so that could, can also be part of the explanation, I think. Great. The, the one thing I would, I would add to this is uh, another way to solve this riddle is to reframe the question and say, how many people would we need to test to get an accurate bounds on the current prevalence? And how many would we need to keep testing on a daily basis to detect changes in that on a day-to-day -day level. And uh, the currently, if we run the uh, math under the optimistic assumption of our, uh, our zero being about, you know, between 0 0.6, 0 0.8, it turns out to be a very large number of tests that we would have to do in order to detect the small changes in prevalence on a day-to-day -day basis that could alert us to the fact that we're seriously underestimating transmission. And it boils down to our inability to test at scale. I mean, it's a blanket crude statement, but by and large, I mean, that's what it's going to bottom out in. Thank you, Nigam. Uh, this next question, I'm going to move on to the next question since we're running out of time. Uh, Nira, perhaps this one might be one for you. Uh, can, how can we balance the load of patient care between Santa Clara County facilities to prevent overloading at any one site? I know something similar came up at Grand Rounds this week. Yeah. No, great question. I think, you know, we have to look at this collaboratively with our community and surrounding hospitals. We have kept in touch with them to get a sense of what their um, capacity was overall for their hospital, what their surge planning, uh, you know, uh, plans were, and their volumes. And for Santa Clara Valley uh, Medical Center, interestingly, their, their numbers paralleled ours. They were pretty close to ours, and they did feel like they had the capacity to handle that. But I think if any uh, hospital did run into trouble, you know, we are here to serve and help and we would, we would accommodate as needed. I know that there was a question regarding um, that someone had commented on early, which is the sort of the post COVID rebound and planning for that. And I don't think we'll be in post COVID state for any time soon. I think we're gonna see a, see a trickle of cases uh, for some time. I mean, even today we had 11 cases this morning in the hospital, three of which were in the ICU. And so what I think we need to plan for, and Kristen and uh, leaders from SHC are part of this initiative, is how do we ramp up both the inpatient and outpatient um, uh, scenes to prepare for this? So infusion centers, clinics, procedural teams, ORs, things like that. And while we had the benefit of having surge teams during the acute crisis of COVID at Stanford, we will not have the benefit of having that many faculty and physicians and fellows available in that stage because they'll be busy with the procedures that they were not getting earlier. And so resources from a, a physician standpoint may be more limited. And you know, there's work that is being initiated to look at that. It would be nice um, in talking to colleagues on the East Coast, they said they could write the playbook for how to plan for surging after what they've been through. Now that our numbers are lower, I think it gives us an opportunity to write a playbook for them, how to plan for the, you know, the post-COVID or the peri-COVID surge afterwards. Regarding the question yeah. about balancing, um, sorry, there was one more part that you had asked. If, if there's a second part to that question that I didn't answer, just let me know. Oh, just, just the balancing between different facilities and right. what do we um, so uh, Laura, Laura asks, uh, do, this is more of a general question to the patient, I believe, but do patients with GI symptoms require hospitalization also have pulmonary issues or multi-organ failure, or are these more dehydration emissions? Maybe near, I think there's quite a variation of what we're seeing. Sure, and while I answer that, I'll say that, you know, the end users have been many in this uh, hospital system. It's been, you know, obviously hospital medicine, the uh, ICU physicians, the nephrologists, the infectious disease specialists, the cardiologists that have been consulted. So there have been many people touching these patients, you know, throughout their hospitalization as needed. 
The GI symptoms, um, you know, there's not good data from this country about do GI symptoms predict uh, that you'll have less pulmonary symptoms or can you have both equally and how, um, you know, those can play out. Like do people who present with GI symptoms in the outpatient setting end up requiring admission more frequently than patients who have respiratory symptoms? We're not seeing any trends yet because it has not been studied, but there are plans to study that. Um, and then there was a question from Laura about, you know, comorbidities. I'll speak to just risk factors and it's, you know, we know that males um, have a higher risk of doing poorly. Um, you know, as you look at progression to ARDS, um, age is also a risk factor, age over 65. And fortunately, Stanford had a very low number of deaths and those patients were geriatric age. Great. Thank you so much. Guys, it's now uh, just after two o'clock. I, I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, helping us better understand all the modeling that's been driving er everything here and at the greater level. Uh, and uh, just so you guys know, I'm going to invite uh, our, our modeling experts to, rel to somewhat regularly come and provide updates at Grand Rounds and potentially uh, at town halls again if if we feel that's necessary as things really changing a lot. So thanks to everybody for your questions online. Sorry, as always, we didn't get to all of them. And if there's anything else I can help with, please reach out to me and I'm happy to try to get that question answered for you. Thanks guys again for your time and hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.